Well, hello again, welcome to Olmec, and I've got a cracky video for you today, and what this video is going to all be about is fuel injector problems on N43, but you can also use this on the N53 engine, so really it'll kind of work for both models. Both engines are quite troublesome, they've always been known to suffer from massive issues with uh, fuel injectors. Now, one thing you can check on these is the index numbers. This is a library image. That's an old index 5, so you wouldn't really want to be kind of recommending to keep them in the car when we're on like index 12 nowadays. Something that you should keep an eye out is that. Fault codes, lots and lots of oxygen sensor fault codes. Basically, if we looked at the uh, description in ISTA, it basically told us that we had a problem with the car running too rich. And we can see that here because we've got loads and loads of fault codes for the old fuel injectors. Now... These cars can be very, very tricky because what can happen usually is you can have issues with, for example, this oil pressure static problem. That's like literally just the most common fault code you'll get on this engine. And I have a lovely video, in fact, the first video I ever made for my channel all about that. So that's not what we're going to deal with today. The second one is there's another catalytic converter on the back of the car, and that's for the NOx system. This car actually runs stoichiometric which means it runs a homogeneous Lambda 1 mix only when it's warming up and only on full throttle. On any other type of um, driving event, such as idling when the engine's warm, cruise, it'll use what's known as stratified mode. And stratified mode means it'll run Lambda 3 super, super lean. You can read more about that online if you want to know more about that. I decided to start looking at this engine because I suspected a fuel injector leak. I could smell it from the exhaust. So I looked at the uh, live data and specifically the smooth running values. Now, if you're not used to these smooth running values, I'll talk you through them. So when you see cylinder number four with a value of 227, it means that the cylinder is actually running a lot faster than the other cylinders. It's a positive value. And when you sometimes get a little bit of extra fuel, that can still ignite, you will get much more velocity on the crankshaft and it will pick that up from the crank sensor. Then if you take another uh, example and you look at this cylinder, actually cylinder 2, it's running slower, so it's a minus value of 175.80. Now these figures, not many people understand them and I don't either. There's a, there's a engineering terminology and there's a scientific terminology of what units of measurement they're using. We don't really need to be concerned with that. We just need to be concerned with that something like 12.9 is kind of on a good engine, whether it's warming up or whether it's fully warm. That's what you want to see really on mostly all the cylinders. They should all be more or less the same. And when you have these massive errors, a huge minus error of 175 or a plus of 227, you know you've got a massive problem with this engine. It's as simple as that. So, if we take this as well, this is another value what BMW use, and it's like called engine harmonics, and it's 0, 5, 1, and 1.5, although the thing tool doesn't display the 1.5. And basically, all you need to know is, if it's above 1, and this is 6.94, you've got a big problem. And it's usually, um, from what I understand, picking up the values from the, the voltages from the NOx, uh, not NOx, the NOx sensors. There's one on, uh, on cylinder 1 and 2, and one cylinder 3 and 4, so there's two in total. It picks them up and it displays them as these values because it knows that when you've got an uneven combustion, you're going to get knock. And when you get knock, this is what it'll be displayed as in the tester. You can find that in ISTA or you can find it in ThinkTool or basically pretty much any generic tester will show that. So we let the engine run again and it's started to become a bit like an intermittent fault, really. The smell from the exhaust of fuel um, dissipated, just smelled normal, really. And the car actually ran remarkably well. All throughout the testing procedures, there was nothing really remarkable to sort of to sort of report. Really, you wouldn't think it was it wasn't misfiring or anything. It was really really unusual. On these engines, though, I knew that I could smell fuel, so I knew there was an issue. But you've got to be really careful because if you don't have diagnostic equipment, um, I don't have a paddle probe anymore. I used to have one, but I don't have anything to check the secondary ignition of the coil, so I can't tell you whether the coil is intermittent, intermittently failing or not. So the only way to do that is to eliminate and rule out the known. And the known in this case is, can we actually spot and physically see any, any fuel leaking? Yes, it's a bit intermittent, but if we push it hard enough, we should find something. 
So what I decided to do was from this point, just have a quick look at some other, well, some other values, basically. There's always something you can find out on these things. So I started to look at the rail pressure. Now, bearing in mind, you can always have a dodgy rail sensor. It doesn't happen very often, not on the high pressure side anyway, but you could see that it just dropped down. So I'll put it on graph form now and I'll show you because I wanted to see what was going on with this engine. At idle, it was quite reasonable. But when I give it some gas, things started to go a bit haywire and it started to feel a bit shaky. You see that huge dip? That is definitely a massive fuel loss. If you haven't got a bad sensor, you've got a bad fuel loss. There's no other way around it. As the line moves horizontally towards the right, that's the idle speed position. And every time it's dipping, it's because I'm actually applying the throttle and I'm giving it some throttle. And when it's under demand, the pressure should rise for way more than 170 bar, but it doesn't. And it drops all the way down, virtually to zero. So that really started getting me thinking. I left it there at idle now. It's running very, very reasonably. Not really leaking, is it? It's stable at 150 bar. But I knew I was dealing with some sort of a fuel problem because I've seen it a million times before. There you are, I'm revving it again and it's dropping off. So let's just freeze that and I'll show you in more detail exactly what I mean. So these are the peaks I just talked about and they're dropping right off. That's fuel loss because you've got a lack of pressure. And there's another one, pretty much the same, all the way through the RPM cycle. When it idles, it's quite reasonable. We can't really argue with it. We can't say there's anything majorly wrong with it at idle. Look at it though, it's perfect. It's as good as you'll get. You wouldn't even think there was a problem there. But like I always say, if you're going to push something, you need to put it under load. Very often things will not fail unless they're under load. Simple as that. So after that, I decided to start looking at some other things because at the end of the day, I only usually have about an hour to diagnose these jobs. I don't have all day. So I need to basically find out in the time I've got as much information as possible. So then I decided to go on to the actual Lambda sensors. Now on this particular car, we're running wideband Lambda. So we're running a system which has a pump circuit, so it uses current. Again, you can go online, you can read all about current-based oxygen sensors or wideband sensors. From live data, first of all, the first thing I saw was the uh, mixture adaption or the fuel trim in other terms. BMW call anything other than idle multiplicative mixture adaption which means um, part load and full load. Idle would be additive adaption. In this case, I decided to focus on the long-term fuel trim on the part load side of it. 13.27 and 10.42, bank 2, bank 1. So bank 2 is cylinders 4 and 3, bank 1, cylinders 2 and 1. Usually around a minus of 8%, the system is maxed out. So this is absolutely running super rich and the DME is trying its very, very best to lean this car out and it cannot lean it out at all because the fuel trims are way off, way off the scale completely. So that was the first thing that um, on the oxygen sensor live data I saw, which made me think, yeah, yeah, definitely got a fuel leak here. We need to, we need to start focusing on the fuel side of things more than let's say, more than the spark side of things, because the engine runs quite well. It doesn't have a misfire, which you would normally get from a dodgy coil. So we take a look at this 13.27. It's showing that it's a lot worse on the back cylinders, particularly number four. I had a feeling about number four all along. It's call it a mechanics hunch. But then again, cylinders one and two, they're also bad at 10.42. So really, we've got a problem essentially with, you know, with both of them. So we've got, I think we've definitely got a fuel leak here at this point. And that's what I'm thinking anyway. So then I start looking at the oxygen sensors themselves. And here we can see on live data, we can see our fuel trims twittering about all over the place. We're at idle speed there. So the sensors are roughly at two volts a piece. Um, look at the adaption value there. It's not so bad. It's only leaning it out a bit or trying to lean it out at minus four. But every now and then, probably as one or two injectors start to leak more because they're intermittently leaking, they're not leaking all the time, it instantly responds because it instantly picks up the um, signal from the oxygen sensor, so it basically responds pretty damn quick. 
So I decided to rev this thing and see what would happen if I give some RPM to it. You focus on the bottom red and green traces, that's the oxygen sensors, before the catechetic converter for both banks. And as you can see, they're running quite reasonable, but when we rev it, which is coming up any minute now, you'll see, there you are, it jumps to 3 volts, signal behind, the signal from the sensor um, after the car, it's switching, so it's responding in that sense. But the main thing about this is the fact that we have this adaption problem. And there we are, that's number 4. No surprises to see that it's running extremely rich. Two and three, not so bad. And number one is the best. It's running quite lean. On these engines, they will run super lean, up to lambda three, actually, which is quite unbelievable if you're not used to that, because they run a stratified lean mode with multiple injection phases per cycle. And just before TDC, in lean mode, the DME will inject a very rich mixture to ignite the unignitable lean mixture. Therefore, you get a really good saving in fuel economy, in theory, that's the theory. Let's take a closer look at this number four spark plug. Well, it looks like a lump of coal, <laughs> so it's obviously running very, very rich. There's no oil on it. It's not wet, so we don't have a, like a, a massive leaking, constantly leaking, pouring in event on the fuel injection side of it, but it is certainly darker than the rest. Well, let's take a closer look at it now. Looking at the top of it, it's quite reasonable on these to be a bit burned on the ceramic insulator because they run super lean usually, but this one is maybe a little bit worse than the others, probably because too much fuel's been going in. And at this point, I definitely was 100% sure that I had an intermittent uh, fuel injection leak on that engine. If we had no spark, we would probably see just a wet spark plug and we wouldn't see a dry, dusty black one. That's a nice one. That was number three. This is number two. That's quite a nice one. Not bad at all, is it? That's what you'd see on any on kind of anything running Lambda 1. This one is kind of what it looks like when you run Lambda 3 and you get a nice lean mix. So I would say number one is probably our best cylinder on this engine at the moment. So, take a quick look at the coils. If you see a coil with that date, 2019, as on this car, we can pretty much, not always, we should test them of course, but you can kind of put it to the back of your mind that you've probably got a pretty good coil. You don't see any burn or track marks which is common on these. So, usually if you can find a coil with say 2004, 2006, 2008, 10, whatever, chuck it in the bin if you've got uh, black um, diagonal marks running down the bottom of it. This one was okay though. So here we are, going to the cylinder of doom in cylinder number four. And there you are, that's the first thing you should look for is the misting. When you see misting like that, that's from an injector that is leaking rail pressure into the cylinder with the engine off. That's a giveaway, and there's a bit more of a different view, but it's the same sort of mist. And there you see the injector is lovely and glistening wet, and that's a massive red flag. And you know you've got a leaking injector, even if it's not leaking at time of test, you've got an intermittent leak. So those are, the, those are the two things you should be looking for. And last of all, if you get really lucky, you'll see a load of fuel sat on top of the piston. And that's always a great thing to see. And then finally, as we started the video, we should end the video the same way. Let's just have another look at that cylinder 4 crank test with okay. everything disconnected. Anyway, it's absolutely boring. Oh, perfect. 